Hi everyone, this is Neil Writer here, also known as the Wax Whisperer. Thank you for joining me in my latest video. I have here a compilation video of quite a few earwax removal procedures and dead skin peels and removals. Um, some of these procedures might be um, quite short and I wouldn't typically for that reason upload it on social media as a singular video. Um, so I decided to group some of these together. Um, if truth be told, the majority of procedures that we perform in clinic, um, it takes no longer than a couple of minutes, both ears. And so these are uh, kind of your more day-to-day -day procedures that uh, we encounter in clinic. Uh, I think there is one challenging one thrown in the mix. but So this is um, patient one, ear one. As you can see, their left ear is completely blocked. They've got this soft um, consistency of earwax. It's quite dark, so it's potentially been there for a while. It's oxidized. Their right ear, uh, which you would have also seen a clip of, was completely clear. So it's just their left side. And I'm just slowly but surely teasing this out of the ear. There's a few hairs matted within this plug of wax and there's a bit of skin enveloped around the circumference of it. So even at this stage the patient's able to hear significantly better and that's because the ear is no longer occluded. Um, there is uh, a, an opening in the ear canal for sound and air to enter and for sound waves to um, hit the eardrum in order to vibrate it. So we've just got some peripheral dead skin just around the edge and the cartilaginous portion. So we'll just use the fine end, just glide around. If it comes away, brilliant. If not, it's completely fine. The eardrum is intact. I think there is a very mild atrophy retraction. So as I started peeling some of that skin, you can see um, some of this dead skin started to peel away towards the eardrum as well. So we're just going to peel away as much as possible, but without taking any uh, silly and undue risks. So this skin is not really going to cause them any massive issue. It potentially may not migrate by itself. Um, and that's why this patient in this left ear had originally had a um, plug of dead skin and wax forming. So this skin that lines the ear canal as it dies and sheds, the ear over millennia has um, developed uh, the unique property of ensuring that the skin moves sideways as it migrates away, almost like a conveyor belt. And any wax sitting on the surface of the skin is therefore also transported out of the ear. And when people do attend with a wax impaction, that's one of the plausible causes as to why um, they are experiencing a buildup. So the skin is just not migrating, or if it is, it's not migrating quick enough. So the ear is producing wax at a quicker rate than the ear is able to naturally expel it. Uh, other potential reasons are that the, um, the, the earwax glands, so there's earwax is a, a, a mix of three primary ingredients. Um, the, the most common ingredient is um, what is called dry matter. We're going to categorize it. It's um, dead skin cells uh, exfoliated within the ear, uh, loose hairs, any debris. So that's all the dry matter, around 60%. And the remaining 40% is a combination of sebum, which is an oily fatty secretion also found in our scalp, and an oily sweat, which we can also find uh, under our armpits. And they all amalgamate. And it could be that these glands that produce the oily sweat, so they're modified apocrine glands or the sebaceous glands that secrete sebum. They're just hyper hyperactive, so they just produce um, oils and sweats at a, a quicker rate than normal. So patient one done. Patient two, it's very similar as you probably saw, it's their left ear again. Um, weirdly enough, and I don't think there's anything, it's, it's probably just coincidental and um, I've never done really any extensive research, but quite commonly if a patient attends with earwax in one ear, it just seems to be the left ear more than the right. And I, I really don't think there's anything more than just being a coincidence or me getting my uh, my observations are not correct, but it's something that I've always kind of uh, wondered. I thought, well, okay, again, it's just one ear, it's the left ear. So um, this wax is a bit more softer, um, and we have used some oil, and I'm just slowly removing it. And I think this is a slightly longer one, if memory serves me correct, just because they have got quite a bendy ear. You can see that there. I'm having to go in and go all the way to the right, stretch the open and then insert the suction probe. And I think they've also got quite a prominent anterior recess. So if it's not this patient, it's another one. And I tried removing wax from the anterior recess. It's 
very difficult because the, the, the bending nature of the patient's ear, the fact that that recess is quite, it's really tucked away in the corner. And we shall see. So you can see once again, there's a few hairs here. Now, hairs that um, in the ears should only be found on the outer third. That's the cartilaginous portion of the ear canal. And that's because the skin that lines the cartilaginous portion contains um, the dermis layer. The dermis layer is where you find the hair follicles, which, of course, where these hair strands are then protruding outwards from. Um, the skin that lines the inner two thirds of the ear canal, the bony part, we only have the epidermis layer. So there's no hair follicles located on the, on the um, inner two thirds of the ear canal. So these hairs uh, are most likely either have been pushed into the ear or when this patient has um, had their hair trimmed or um, the ear has cut, um, they may have just flown into the ear canal. So that's another plausible cause. So I'm just using the fine end now. If this wax was a bit firmer and drier, what we would have probably found is that this residual wax would come away a lot more easier. But because it's quite soft and loose and mushy, you can see it's just not coming away. Now, patient can hear a lot better again. So um, uh, whenever we perform wax removal, the, the main objective is to make sure the patient is uh, are clean enough so they can hear. Ear wax removal cannot be compared with car cleaning. Um, and it's a really important distinction to make. We're not, obviously, when you get your car washed, you want it, you do want it washed completely. Earwax removal is completely different. Um, in fact, earwax is a, 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 a natural healthy um, secretion produced by the ear. And it's designed to serve and protect us. And it does that in many different ways. Earwax is mildly acidic. So the acidity helps to repel insects, believe it or not, from entering the ear. Um, the acidity also helps to inhibit bacterial and fungal growth. Um, this is bad bacteria and bad fungi. There's, there is a natural... Um, uh, um, bacteria and fungi that actually reside on the skin. We call it skin flora. So there is um, some healthy bacteria and fungi that is accustomed to the natural pH of the ear. So and these are healthy bacteria and fungi which protect the ear from more harmful bacteria and fungi. So the acidity helps to inhibit harmful bacteria and fungal growth. Um, earwax is uh, also hydrophobic. So it helps to repel water uh, out of the ear because water is bad for the ear. It's sticky, so it, it, it attracts any dust, dirt, pollen that may into the ear. Um, and as I mentioned it before, um, earwax typically makes its own way out of the ear. And earwax is oily and greasy, so it helps to moisturise the skin, prevent it from drying and cracking. So there's many benefits to earwax. And of course, when you've got a build-up like this, the patient has then it's counterproductive. Um, other plausible reasons as to why people get a buildup of wax, as, uh, in addition to those earlier um, reasons I listed in the first uh, case, is like this patient, they've got a very bendy, twisty ear canal. So as the wax is traveling around the bends, they, it slows down the migration. So you get a buildup. If you've got a tremendous amount of hairs, then the wax can mat against it. Now, uh, in, in some literature, these hairs are, uh, are described as being uh, there, not only to produce these oils and sweats, but also to help earwax naturally migrate. I'm not sure if that's necessarily true, but it may well be. It's just something that I don't see what, how the hairs would help the wax naturally migrate. Um, it's more jaw movements and this natural skin migration that I described earlier that are the main causes. Um, if you've got any abnormalities of the ears, if you've got any abnormal uh, uh, widenings or erosions and potholes, wax can drop down these potholes and widenings and find it difficult to migrate out. So that's uh, another reason. Um, patients with really, really narrow ear canals. So we do see a lot of patients with Down syndrome. Uh, so Down syndrome patients do have very narrow um, station tubes, nasal passages, and also ear canals so they, they tend to require a lot of de-waxing there is um i'm just trying to think of other reasons and um, probably the most common reason though is self-inflicted when pe people try and clean their ears out themselves so you just 
we're actually just pushing it further in, unfortunately. Now, when you swivel and swirl around a cotton bud in your ear and you remove it, you may see some residual wax on that cotton bud, but that's an invisible layer that's coating the canal wall that's dead to uh, protect it. If you think about um, furniture and you, you varnish it, um, think about earwax on the same thing. It's just a varnish, so to speak. It helps to protect the ear canal. Um, so just using the fine end, you may see that I've have to bend the fine end just to get access here because it's, it was so bendy and twisty and narrow. Now, we're not going to get all of it out, guys. Um, so please refrain from sending me any hate email. But sometimes, sometimes we do get, if we leave a bit of wax behind. I know some of you probably think, really? Yes, we do, unfortunately. Um, so we're obviously doing our best to remove every little last speck. But then there comes a time when you decide, mm. so we just, it's, it's always a benefit risk ratio. Now, we're in someone's ear, we're vacuuming, it's a bit noisy, we're using a fine end, so we're, we're minimising that. Um, but with microsuction, probably the, the biggest risk, if truth be told, it's not perforating the eardrum. Although, I'm, I'm sure that, that, obviously, it is a risk, I can't deny it's not, but it's mainly the noise. Um, so with micros, it's, you can all imagine if you, you know, I no longer do, uh, past my heyday maybe, but um, when I used to be younger, I used to attend a lot of concerts, uh, gigs, loud, noisy environments, and um, I used to come away and my ears used to ring for a day or two. And that's because your ears are taking a battering. Uh, we all got these little microscopic sensory hair cells within the organ of hearing the cochlea and in response to loud sounds we get a buildup of unwanted toxins that your ear needs to flush away um, and also these hair cells undergo physical um, contortions and distortions they lose their shape and your ears need around 48 hours to recover and during that 48 hours period so until these hair cells um, reshape themselves and the, the ear flushes out all these unwanted toxins we can experience a temporary reduction in hearing and also um, a bit of a tinnitus a ringing or buzzing noise in the ear so and that's guys that's three on the trot so uh, this is patient three so you can see there's a bit of little bit of wax left but the benefit to the risk ratio was outweighed so we left that the patient could hear not a problem hopefully that little bit of wax will migrate on its own accord there's no wax sitting in front of it now and no, I'm not going to irrigate that. Uh, definitely not, because irrigation has far more risk, especially in a patient's ear like that. It's very bendy and twisty and the water can get logged. Water is just going to wash away the natural lacquer, that, that um, veneer, that varnish that I described. And it, you can just, you, for, you're probably putting that ear more at risk of then leading to an infection. You know, we don't, we don't want that. But this is the third case on the trial. Uh, these are old videos, guys. So I'm not deliberately putting them together in such a way to to show you that, again, this patient's got just an earwax infection in one ear and it's their left ear again. So how strange. And again, I'm sure it's just a coincidence. It's, well, I might have to just start documenting it actually and see what I come up with is if it, you know, and then do a statistical analysis, which I've done previously as part uh, when I was doing my PhD, but I probably won't be able to do it anymore. It's been a long time. So I'll have to get someone to do that on my behalf, but just to see if there's anything more into it. Um, who knows? Our, it could be that if we're right-handed, for example, our left ear is um, it's configured in a certain way in comparison to the opposite ear. It could be uh, some sort of evolutionary advantage of one ear being a certain shape to pick up certain sounds. And obviously the curvature of the ear will have some effect on the resonance of the ear. So when I say resonance of the ear, imagine you've got um, five empty bottles and you fill up those bottles with um, water to various and differing degrees, and then you then blow the top of the bottles. Because of the surface area and the amount of water in each bottle, when you blow the top, you'll get a, a natural resonance. The, the, the tune produced by you blowing over the bottle will be different for all, all of those bottles. And the ear itself, um, the, the, the diameter, the length, the curvature, the amount of um, cartilage, bone, these can all affect the natural resonance of the ear. So the natural resonance is the, as a frequency that's naturally amplified by a certain cavity. So um, if you think about musical instruments, the 
bigger the internal cavity of a musical instrument, say one of your percussion wind instruments, you're going to get, it's going to, going to produce a more lower frequency sound. And the smaller the internal cavity, uh, that their natural resonance is more of a higher frequency sound. So again, this patient's got a really uh, twisty, bendy ear, you can see. And the inner third, I will say, the skin's really dry. You can see there, you get, um, the skin's dying and it's cracking. So this earwax, um, and it was more lateral, it would appear that it's not dissipating. So although the majority of earwax is produced on the outer third, it, this earwax should then spread, it should dissipate itself. Um, across the entire ear canal and also the eardrum to moisturize the entire ear. But in this case, it would appear the inner third, the skin is quite dry. You can see that it's quite a distinct border. So that's a bit interesting. Now, again, this wax that I'm removing, it's on the outer third. I would definitely 110% not be doing this on the bony part because it will be uncomfortable for the patient. Um, yeah, it's not an invisible layer, it is visible, but it's not occluding the ear, so I'm just removing as much as I can without causing any trauma to the patient. But the ear, eardrum is intact, visible. You can just see the curvature and the architecture of this ear. I'm looking straight into it. You've got this massive um, upward sloping um, incline, this peak, and all of our ears do incline upwards around 32 degrees. But this is quite significant. So excess of 45 degrees that and then the ear drops down and it veers off to the left so yeah it's quite a, a challenging ear for that reason but fortunately the wax was more lateral if the wax was deeper in this ear just like the patient before that was probably not as bendy and twisty as this though it may have been a bit of a challenge getting the deeper wax out because it would have to straighten this ear if our ears were straight, it would make earwax removal a lot uh, easier. But the fact that they're not, and they're, they're designed not to be straight for a reason. Our ears have evolved um, to be an S shape, um, have a sigmoid shape, to protect the eardrum. So if you've got a foreign body entering the ear, it's going to have to navigate across these bends um, before making contact with the eardrum. So this is next patient so in this case their left ear was fine it's their right ear as you can see that's blocked and the reason why i probably look twice in that patient's left ear um, remember these videos are quite old i'm just going through the catalog just trying to uh, upload some of the shorter work videos it's possibly because they've got a slight attic retraction so that um, the top part of the ear was buckled inwards slightly so i'll describe that a bit more during the course of the video so this Patient's right here, this is all dead skin. So if this was my ear, um, this skin would have naturally migrated outwards. It's died, it's shedded. And you can see the skin, it's still, it, it's still attached to... Uh, so when the skin is lining the ear canal itself, you've got these individual skin cells. Um, they're, they're called um, squamous skin cells. And the term squamous, I think it's Latin for fish scale. So that's how it looks. And they are interlinked. So it's almost like a lamella structure. But when the skin dies and just sheds and starts to migrate, these individual skin cells just separate from one another. So this link should slowly be broken and you get individual skin cells and then exfoliate out of the ear. But in this particular case, you can see the skin um, and also most skin peels that we, we perform, the skin has failed to, um, the individual skin cells still remain together. They haven't uh, disengaged with one another and interlocked. Um, so we're just peeling that away. So yes, if it's my, the skin would naturally come out at this age. Now in the future, who knows? My skin may also stop migrating as it should be. So I, I might yet put reduced blood flow. The skin could get dry, which is common as we get older because our ears produce less of these natural oils and sweats. So you can see there's got this thin layer of skin still on the eardrum, just slowly bringing it away, just gently peeling it. You've got an amazing view of the eardrum there. The eardrum slowly starting to reveal itself. I'm not going to lie, that's quite satisfying to watch back. Um, I know a lot of page, uh, a lot of uh, subscribers, viewers, followers of the channel really enjoy the skin peels, and I, and for that reason, so there's still a bit of crimpled skin inferiorly. We're just going to see if that comes away. 
but of course we're so close to the eardrum now we're going to be really really gentle but i'm not sure let's just see what happens okay so there is a sheet of skin extending out of the eardrum but i don't think it's going to come away fully which again oh might, might be wrong i Let's see. Yeah, well, I'm happy with that. There's a little bit left there, but that's not technically on the eardrum. It's more on the, in the anterior recess on the canal wall, so it's going to peel some skin there. Let's have a look. So this eardrum doesn't look retracted. Am I going to go back in? You can see. Now, you may have seen at the eardrum this white perimeter. We call that the annulus. I think in this patient, it's been between two o'clock and about 11 o'clock or 10 o'clock. The annulus is what stretches the eardrum um, and it's made of a fibroid cartilage. So uh, that's what that part of the eardrum was. This is another patient. I think we're evening ourselves out now. So this patient's left ear. I, I, I remember this ear. Um, as soon as I enter it, I, just by looking at the video, this patient, I'm 100% sure, has got, we can see the head of the stapes burn, the eardrum's retracted. Yep, there we are. This is a patient that has to come every year. And it's something about their earwax, so I can recognise this patient's ear straight away. And with this patient, it's always their right ear. The left ear is fine. And again, I think the reason why this patient's getting this wax and also a lot of dead skin buildup is because of their retraction. So I, I talked about an attic retraction earlier, so let me just discuss with, um, what I mean by retraction. Behind the eardrum, we have what we call the middle ear. Now, the middle ear consists of the three little ear bones um, and the eustachian tube, which is a narrow tube, narrow orifice that connects the back of the eardrum, so the middle ear to the back of the nose. Now, ideally, we want the air pressure in the middle ear to be equal or similar to the air pressure in the atmosphere, so in the ear canal. And therefore, uh, it's the function of the eustachian tube to equalize the air pressure so it allows air to either enter the middle ear or exit the middle ear in order to equalize it um, depending upon your altitude and the air pressure you find yourself in so this eustachian tube it connects to the back of the nose and that's where it opens and closes and at normal resting state the eustachian tube is closed it's closed for a good reason it prevents you from hearing your own voice louder in your head and uh, uh, to causing any distortion to your own voice because if you can if your voice travels up the eustachian tube and it hits the underside of your eardrum and it's also going to be heard externally so when you you talk your voice gets projected out it's going to enter your ear canal you're hearing your voice twice not only up your nose up the eustachian tube but also from the external ear canal and they're going to arrive at the eardrum at different times they're probably going to reach the eardrum quicker up your nose up the eustachian tube in comparison to the ear canal because it's got a shorter distance to travel so you'll, you'll hear yourself twice, you'll get a muffled voice. So the eustachian tube normally is shut for that reason. And it's also shut to prevent any upper respiratory tract infection from traveling up the eustachian tube and infecting your middle ear. But during brief moments in the day when you swallow, yawn or chew, the eustachian tube, uh, the muscles either side where it connects to the back of the nose, they contract, causing the eustachian tube to open and allow the air to equalize. So this is the same patient, this is their left ear, if I'm correct, yep. So there's a bit of skin here, we're just going to, uh, near the end, just going to, I don't think I charged the patient for this, we're just going to give it a quick clean up, just any large bits, nothing, we're not going to, we're not going to give this ear a car wash, just going to hover over, this is probably not going to come out, if I'm honest, um, it hasn't in the past, so we just always mop it up. So yeah, when the, the muscles contract, the eustachian tube opens, the air pressure can equalise, but if the eustachian tube fails to open, and it could be because... One, the patient's just anatomically got a very narrow eustachian tube. Two, the muscles have um, almost become paralysed or weakened, they don't contract. Three, there may be some physical obstructions or nasal polyp, for example, um, or deviated septum. Or five, an infection, so rhinitis, sinitis. So, and there's probably other reasons as well, so allergies, any congestion mucus there. Um, the, all the remaining, so air can't travel up the eustachian tube, it can't equalise the air pressure. Any remaining air in the middle ear through gaseous exchange is absorbed by the cells, the mucosa cells lining the middle ear, and until eventually where there's no air whatsoever in the middle ear. That creates a vacuum, your eardrum gets pulled in, and that vacuum then causes fluid within the, uh, the cells lining the middle ear to, um, to be released into the middle ear, 
and this fluid um, should drain out of the eustachian tube because it's blocked, it can't. But when you get that vacuum effect, when your eardrum gets pulled in, we call that a retraction. So on that one case where I re-entered the patient's clean ear, their left ear to look, there was an attic retraction there. Nothing significant, but it was there. With that patient I just treated on the right side, their eardrum it has been like that for years. They've seen ENTs, no further treatment required. But their eardrum was so sucked in posteriorly to the back part where it was actually, as it's caused an erosion of their incus, which is the middle ear bone. When um, the ossicles in the middle ear can um, begin to decay and get infected, we call that uh, process necrosis, osteonecrosis. And it could be because it's, there's an infection in the middle ear, like a cleshiotoma or even glue ear over a prolonged period of time, or when the eardrum is sucked in, it can actually wrap itself around the bone. And that incus bone is quite susceptible, the long process. And when that eardrum um, is sucked in, think about it like a cling, piece of cling film, which is, just, you could just, it's a good comparison actually of the eardrum to a piece of cling film. It wraps around the bone and it compresses and constricts all the blood arteries and capillaries. So. The bone is then starved of all the oxygen and nutrients it requires and it begins to decay. So in that particular patient, the posterior, uh, sorry, the, the long process of the incus has eroded because of this severe retraction, which has meant we can see uh, the head of the stapes. So the stapes is the smallest bone in the body, also known as a stirrup. Uh, it attaches to the organ of hearing uh, via the oval window and the joint at which the stapes bone connects to the incus, uh, we, we call it the incostabedal joint, uh, but it's the head of the stapes that connects to the end of the, 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 the incus bone. And that was visible, it was like a little ball, so like a, uh, a socket joint, ball socket joint there, because the eardrum was wrapped around. But the patient doesn't actually have much of a hearing loss there. And that's because that stapes is being directly stimulated by the eardrum because it's attached to it. So uh, ENT have discharged the patient. Um, it's not causing many problems really, just apart from the skin buildup and dead and wax. And when you've got a retraction of the eardrum like that, I often find that you do get a lot of dead skin buildup because remember the skin starts to die and shed and migrate from the eardrum itself. The outer layer of the eardrum is made up of dead skin. And so if there's any abnormality with the eardrum, so a retraction, for example, skin can sometimes get trapped and it may not fully uh, migrate out of the ear. So um, this is another patient here with quite soft, sticky, waxed skin just at the entrance of the ear and just trying to lift it away from the base of the ear canal. You can see it's really got this adhesive property and... There's a bit of dead skin on the right hand side that's attached itself to the wax plug. So I'm just, just manipulating this. Uh, oh, it came out in a big plug, which, which is great. You see at the entrance, quite hairy ear. There's a few hairs in the ears as well. Some of these hairs that are actually in the ear, they're not always loose hairs. They're hairs that are still attached to the outside part of the ear. So uh, uh, on the front part of your ear, uh, on, uh, above your cheeks. And they actually kind of go into the patient's ear, they're that long, they somehow, so the, so the root is external, but the, the tip goes into the ear, so um, just gonna, we, we can actually move them sometimes just by, you know, moving your finger across the patient's top of their ear and you'll, you'll remove any attached hairs. Uh, the patient's skin, it's quite dry, you may see that, especially right at the entrance. So, Again, these videos are quite old, but pretty sure this patient would be, just from their ear profile, uh, more elderly and most likely male. And that's because as we get older, the skin does become drier. Don't get me wrong, you can get younger patients who have a terribly dry skin, of course, but it's more prevalent in the older populations. And that's because your ears just produce nat less natural oils, so it, it can't moisturise the skin as well. And of course, with these hairs, it is a male thing, unfortunately. Um, I'm experiencing it myself. Yeah, your, your body stops growing hairs where you want them, i.e. Um, your, your, the back of your, your scalp and the crown region, and you start growing hairs in places where you don't really want, so on the side of your ears and in your nostrils. And I, I, I would 
that is definitely more gender specific. I think there's some research about it as well. I think it's kind of it's to do with more testosterone buildup. But um, yeah, that I would this patient would fit um, uh, more of a male, older patient. And similar to this, I think this is a different client. But got all these hairs matted, quite dark wax. This patient has got somewhat a collapsed ear canal entrance. So the cartilaginous portion of the ear canal, as we get older, is more susceptible to collapsing. Um, that's because the cartilage can weaken over time and the back part of the cartilage of the ear can continue to grow. So it has less structural support. If you think about our nose, now our nose is um, configured similarly to our ears in some respects. It's subdivided into cartilage and bone. Um, I think with the nose, it's the the lower two thirds is made up of cartilage and the upper third bone, whereas our ears is the outer third cartilage and the inner two thirds bone. But the tip of our nose, as we get older, because it's made of cartilage, it's just more susceptible to weakening and uh, that's partially because possibly there's less blood flow there, less vascularization, less transfer of nutrients that the ear needs. Um, and then gravity takes its effect, so you get a droopy tip sometimes. Um, similarly with the, with the ear, uh, you can get a collapsed canal. If it's due to uh, overextension of the back part of the cartilage, I know some surgeries can kind of trim that, um, just give it some more structural rigidity. But it, if it's just the only problem it's causing is a, a once in a while clean of the ear, it, it's not really, you know, again, it's that risk benefit ratio I discussed about earwax. There's no real benefit of patient undergoing surgery to increase the aperture of the ear canal if it, if it's just a, a, the alternative is just to getting your ears cleaned out once in a while which is what's happened to this patient so um, now I know this patient um, I can kind of remember um, this patient actually it's because it's a regular patient it's, it's like that other patient where I said immediately this patient's got a retraction of the back part of the eardrum this patient does trim their ear hairs and they are starting to now just place some cotton wool at the entrance to prevent hairs flying in as they're trimming it. Because um, they then can mat against the wax. But otherwise, the, the ear is quite healthy. As you can see, it's got a nice colour to it. It's nice and pink. Uh, the inner two thirds of the ear can at least appear very hydrated. The eardrum is nice and healthy. You just see how collapsed that is. It's hard to get the instrument in. So again, there's probably going to be a bit of debris left behind, but that's fine. And guys, it is fine. Uh, um, but I, I will um, take a picture of my ear. I've got some bit of wax in my ear, but it's there for a reason. Um, so Now, this is, I think, the last couple of procedures. Uh, this is a, a lovely gentleman who actually uh, just came recently. Um, they uh, watch my YouTube videos. They come from Luton. And... So you've got a bit of dry skin there, but they owned up straight away. Yes, they have been using cotton buds, which is pretty obvious. You can just tell anyway. So, but yeah, just going to remove this. And they have got a bit of a narrow juncture of the eardrum as we approach the, uh, the ear canal as we approach the eardrum. So this is lodged. Just going to slowly wriggle it out left and right. See it's, so be, you may be able to see that narrowing. You can see the perimeter of the ear canal, and then it widens. You can see I'm bringing that plug through the widening on the right side. That's where the ear canal kind of balloons and protrudes outwards. So that part of the ear is called the ethmus. And so it narrows and widens. And you know, quite often, if you use a cotton bud, you can wedge wax into that recess, the anterior inferior recess. So we just pull that through. This is more superficial. Yeah, if I'm going to hover over it, I can get it. Brilliant, but we don't over. We don't want to spend too much time in the patient's ear unnecessarily without any massive reward, because again, if you remember earlier, you're exposing the patient to sound. Yeah, we're using the fine end, so it is. It's not. Uh, it's it's tolerable. It's not excessively loud, but still. And we, the last thing we want to do is cause a micro abrasion or cut of the ear canal. And we don't want to leach this ear completely of wax. Now, with suction, it's really impossible to do that, because. Even if, when I remove this, you may see the canal wall and you think, ah, brilliant, I've got all the wax out, but there's a thin veneer there, guys. It's almost invisible to the naked eye. And we don't want to remove all that, we want that. I mean, after I shower, um, the side of my lips get very, very dry. And if I don't put any moisturiser on there, 
um, quickly. It begins to dry and crack. We're talking about 10, 15 minutes. It really does get dry. And the reason for that is obviously when I'm showering, I'm using soap, I'm washing away these natural oils that my skin produce. And I would suspect that I don't produce much in that region. So anything that I do produce, it's washed away, it's leached away by the hot water, especially can cause that soap. Um, and then the skin that lines that uh, either side of my lips is exposed. It's got no oily membrane sitting on top um, to help it retain its natural internal moisture. So the, the moisture within the skin rises to the surface and it evaporates. So I have to put moisturizer in, moisturizer in uh, every time I um, get water on my face, really. And that part, so that part of my, my, my mouth is quite sensitive. So this is the same patient, this is their left side. Again, just teasing it out. You can see all those hairs up. They, they shouldn't be there. And again, the patients said that they've been using cotton buds. So yeah, well, I hope you enjoyed this compilation. It's more of the more common procedures we'll see in clinics. So um, I probably wouldn't put them alone because this is not long enough, but um, have a great um, time, guys, wherever you're watching this. Um, keep well, and we should all speak soon. Thank you. Bye.